A missing child. A bomb disguised as a Christmas gift. A civil rights era Klan murderer brought to justice. Join David Ridgen as he and victims' family members track down leads, speak to suspects, and search for answers in the CBC's hit cold case podcast, Someone Knows Something. Subscribe to SKS wherever you get your podcasts. This is a CBC Podcast. Dance Anin Bujou. Hello and welcome. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Rosetta Deerchild. They say you are what you eat. But what does that mean during this uncertain time when we can't gather around tables or share a meal with friends and family? The food industry is being hit hard by COVID-19, and the pandemic is impacting food security in Indigenous communities. This week on Unreserved, from Indigenous chefs cooking up comfort to a community freezer stocked with seal, we're talking with Indigenous leaders working to change the future of food. Sean Sherman is an award-winning Oglala Lakota Sioux chef, cookbook author, and Indigenous cuisine educator. His culinary work has received international recognition and numerous awards. And if you think that's a mouthful, Sean is about to launch a new project. The Indigenous Food Lab is a vision that he's been working towards for years. I've reached Sean in Minneapolis. Sean, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. What is the Indigenous Food Lab? Well, Indigenous Food Lab is a part of our nonprofit that we created a couple of years ago. Our nonprofit is called Natifs, N A T I F S dot org, and it's an acronym for North American Traditional Indigenous Food Systems. And what Indigenous Food Lab is, it's a restaurant that we're going to be opening that's open to the public, but more importantly, it's a center for Indigenous-focused education. We want to be offering a lot of curriculum around everything that kind of has to deal with Indigenous food systems. So Native American agriculture and seed saving and farming and wild food and ethnobotany and cooking techniques of all kinds and food preservation and using the Food Lab itself as a skill-building place where people can come and work with us because our real goal goal with Indigenous Food Lab is working with tribal communities, um, starting in our vicinity and helping them to develop their own Indigenous foods entity for their community. That could be something like a catering operation or a full-scale restaurant if they have the means, and using ourselves as support and development. So it's going to be a really cool program, and we're really excited to roll it out this year. And why did you want to launch the Indigenous Food Lab? Well, for me, I grew up on Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, which has always been pretty much the poorest area in the United States ever since its inception. And there's a lot of food insecurity around the community that I grew up in, where a lot of my family still lives today. And I had been a chef in the city of Minneapolis for a few years, ever since the very early 2000s, and a few years into my chef career, realizing in the culinary world that there was very little representation of indigenous foods out there at all. Even myself, like I could name hundreds of European recipes off the top of my head. I could only name a handful of Lakota recipes that were truly Lakota and, you know, not mixed up with like cream of mushroom soup or something, right? <laughs> hey, that's a staple. That's I, a staple. I know. <laughs> but I wanted to really truly understand what my ancestors were eating and how they were preserving food and where they were getting their food and how they were selecting it and all these questions that I had. And I spent quite a few years researching to figure out how to bring this into the world that we live in today. So I just really want to do something that's going to be impactful and resonate um, with our future generations. And food security and food sovereignty and health is something that is extremely important for our communities today. And we, we need to do something about it. So I think it's just really necessary um, today, you know, to have this because every single region and every single city should have food that represents the land that it sits on to tell that story from the indigenous perspective. And we really need it even more so in our indigenous communities to really bring back a sense of health, you know, because we struggle from so much food insecurity and health issues because of that. It's a necessity for our future to create access and, and knowledge and skills around Indigenous foods so we can pass it to our own children. Sean, you mentioned uh, food sovereignty. What is the difference between that and food security? 
Well, food sovereignty in general is really just how a community can really work together to create and to be able to survive with its own food when it comes down to a very simple definition, you know. So it's really focused on food from that community. Um, it's really about preserving and building those skills and, pre and saving those skills. It's about understanding how our indigenous cultures um, survived um, working with nature and not against it and really understanding the value of knowing all these plants around us for food and for medicine and and for crafting and for everything that's been passed down to us. And it's just all this nutrition that comes out of that. Um, but it's also having control over our local food systems and not having governments tell us uh, as indigenous communities what we're supposed to eat and where we're supposed to get our food from. So we really need control over that too. Because for us as indigenous peoples, our cultural and historical food is it's part of who we are. It's our, our identity. And we need to preserve that. Mm. And what is your hope for uh, the food lab. Well, um, we're going to be opening here in Minneapolis, Minnesota to begin with um, this year. We, we're going to open up a lot sooner if the if this crisis hadn't happened. But we're, we're still on track and we're just kind of waiting for the dust to settle to see how things change as we move forward. But we're still on track to open this year. And, you know, we have quite a few tribes nearby us um, to work with directly and help them do the work that we're set out to do. And eventually we're going to open up indigenous food labs in cities all over the place, you know. So for the states, we're going to be in areas like Seattle and and Boston, Chicago, um, Denver, Albuquerque. Um, but then we really don't see borders. So we can be throughout Canada with a lot of our friends and partners up there. We can be down in Mexico, up in Alaska, of course. And there's no reason to open up food labs in areas all around the globe to help preserve indigenous knowledge everywhere. Wow, that's exciting. But since there is a pandemic uh, currently in the world, how has that impacted these launch plans for you. So we're just going to wait to see, like, how do we open up a safe restaurant um, in the new reality that we have um, coming up? And um, so we're just going to make some really strong decisions and just keep an eye on how things are in the world. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talk about how the pandemic is impacting the food industry. And um, there's lots of uncertainty about what dining out will look like from now on. What role do you think your work and Indigenous foods generally can play in the future of the food industry? I believe it really makes our work even more important because if we had a slightly better, healthier lifestyle, especially with nutrition, we can really become stronger as a people, you know. So getting this uh, food and passion out into indigenous communities and helping these communities design food that is geared towards them, um, their tribe, their language, their history, um, their surroundings, environment, and using a lot of the wild foods nearby them, and really hopefully getting the younger generations really excited about that notion and knowing that they're going to feel better eating indigenous foods. So I feel like, you know, as indigenous peoples, you know, we've suffered through so much, um, especially, you know, with the 1800s of so much loss and destruction and the 1900s of so much uh, just, you know, um, whitewashing and disappearance and invisibility, basically. And I feel like we're at an era now of evolution because we have this next generation of educated young indigenous youth um, and people who are going to be able to make a change because we can walk in both worlds of really, truly understanding the lessons from our ancestors and applying them into this modern world that we have with all sorts of technology and everything at our fingertips to become something bigger and stronger. Mm -hmm. Now, we've been talking about the future of Indigenous foods, and I'm curious about your past. You're from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. What was it like for you uh, growing up in terms of food experience? Pine Ridge is one of the largest reservations in the U.S. You know, it's just a lot of open land. And, you know, we didn't have restaurants growing up on Pine Ridge. Um, and we had very little food access on the reservation. We had a grocery store and some convenience stores kind of scattered about, but not really obviously enough for that size of uh, population that was there. Um, and nutrition is something that's always been, you know, um, tough on people. You know, for me, I grew up with the Commodity Food Program, which was government state staples of, you know, everything that we know so well of cans of uh, all sorts of veggies and fruits and staples like flour and sugar and lard and, uh, you know, the, uh, the famous American blocks of cheese. 
and pieces like that. That has really nothing to do with who we are and our history and our food. And I think it's really important to bring that back. So growing up on Pine Ridge was a big help to me with where I'm at today to really see through the injustices that are out there around food security um, and what we can be doing to make a difference. As as a chef, um, I feel very responsible of the food that we serve people. And we made a conscious decision early on to only serve healthy food. You know, our focus is with indigenous foods where we cut out colonial ingredients like dairy and flour and sugar, even beef, pork and chicken, and really um, have been working hard to showcase there's all sorts of amazing stuff that we could be learning by learning our indigenous foods. Sounds delicious. How do you think we got to this place where we had all these beautiful indigenous uh, foods from the land to where indigenous people are are accepting, as you said, commodity food from the government and this prepackaged uh cream of uh, mushroom soup, as we referred to earlier. And that was a big question for me when I started studying, because I looked at my own lifetime. Um, I was born in 1974. So one 100 years prior to my birth in 1874, my Lakota ancestors, they basically had 100% of their knowledge intact, and their food systems were still alive uh, 100% at that point in history. Um, they didn't discover gold in the Black Hills in South Dakota until 1876. So within less than a century, like how did so much destruction and loss happen. So really, truly understanding the history of what happened and really trying mm-hmm. to find out what was lost, you know, was a big part of trying to understand what to rebuild. So after we got through the 1800s, where we saw a lot of war, a lot of destruction, genocide, that was a really intense century for indigenous peoples. And then throughout the 1900s, with all the boarding school systems and residential schools, and, you know, just the whitewashing of everything, we've lost, we lost, started losing so much culture. Um, And I think it's really important to understand those true histories and to teach those true histories um, to our to our youth and to our communities and to non-Indigenous peoples who might not even understand how they got to where they live today and the people that have lived there for thousands of generations. You know, there's so many pieces to it. But again, like just having that understanding of what was lost, we can start to rebuild. Mm -hmm. I really see a future where hopefully we can drive across our continent any direction and stop at Indigenous focused restaurants run by Indigenous indigenous peoples, um, utilizing food that's grown from indigenous peoples, and we can see the immense amount of amazing diversity that we have across North America. That's quite a vision. <laughs> indigenous foods as far as the eye can see. What's what's the coffee shop up there? Uh, Tim Hortons? Yeah, so like if a Tim Hortons can <laughs> open up hundreds of units in a year, you know, across the board, even throughout the U.S., like why can't we use a system like that for good and really push healthy and conscious foods out there and really make a change? So there's no reason to not have it in every single area. And we're basically using this restaurant model to be able to help spread that in a quick manner. So why does this this work matter to you? Why are you so hungry as <laughs> as I might borrow the term, for indigenous cuisine? Well, number one, it needs to be acknowledged because people really need to know what true North American foods are because it's not fried bread tacos or bannock. It goes way deeper than that, you know, and it's not poutine, obviously, or hamburgers, right? So we need to really explore what are our true regional um, flavors of North America. And to really understand that, we have to really truly understand the lessons from all this diverse, all these diverse nations of indigenous communities that we have across everywhere, you know. So when we look at North America, we're looking at Mexico all the way up through Alaska and all of this amazing history and diversity and food systems that lie throughout there with huge reaches of amazing um, agriculture and, you know, vast knowledges of wild plants and ethnobotany um, and just so many ways people had figured out um, to create amazing foods and recipes. Um, And it's, you know, people should be really excited about exploring that and how every single region is completely unique because it's got its own flavor its own foods and the people you know so when you look at the indigenous communities like every you know every few hundred uh, miles or kilometers whichever you're using like it changes like you're in a different language and a different religion and there's different stories and different foods you know it's exciting yeah well i can hear the excitement in your voice good luck and thank you so much for your time today thank you very much for having me Sean Sherman is an Oglala Lakota Sioux chef, cookbook author, and indigenous cuisine educator. He's the founder of the Sioux Chef and co-founder of the nonprofit Natives. The Indigenous Food Lab will open later this year. If you want to find out more about Sean's work, visit our website at cbc.ca slash unreserved.
Trudy Metcalf Co. is one of thousands of Inuit living in Ottawa, the city with the biggest Inuit population outside the north. Despite having community in her city, she misses the foods that remind her of Nain, where she lived as a young girl. So she tries to incorporate those foods and flavors into her own cooking, but often with a little twist. Our Kyle Musica visited her in the kitchen, where she was already cooking up a storm. That's not going to be big enough. Oh, here we go. So my name is Trudy Metcalf Co. Right now we're at my mother-in-law's house, beautiful living room that my husband renovated, <laughs> and smelling what's in the kitchen. <laughs> So for, for dinner tonight, I'm making curried caribou with jasmine rice. I'm also going to be oven roasting some cauliflower and a garlic butter. I've been cooking since I've been 12. Uh, I've been catering for 20 years, uh, 1998, so 22 years. So I'm from Nain Nunatsiavut originally, lived there until I was about seven years old. I remember spending time with my grandfather, things with like fish and caribou and my father seal hunting and uh, berry picking and ptarmigans and getting eggs out on the islands and stuff like that. And I remember, and I, I, I must have been maybe about six years old, and this is my one of my strongest memories of eating country food. It was, we were in bed. I don't know if it was the middle of the night or like eight o'clock at night. It was bedtime. We were asleep and I woke up. And I got up and I went out and my father was cooking caribou tongue. And I remember tasting it and I have yet to this day to experience that again. Like, because we just don't get caribou tongue down here. They never make it because people always eat them in the north. So somebody needs to send me caribou tongue. <laughs> just one. That's all I want is one caribou tongue. So growing up and my grandfather smoking Arctic char. I remember sitting outside because in, in Labrador we have trees or bushes. and Well, they, were, they weren't as big as they are now. But I remember my grandfather smoking char when we were growing up. And the day that they were going to come out of the smokehouse, sitting on the step, and he would just give me a whole half Arctic char. And I would just, I, I remember like the oils from the fish just all over my hands and everything and just loving it. When I moved to, I was 22 when I moved to Ottawa. And I went to the Inuit Community Center that was here at the time because I was going to, I came, I moved here and then I decided I was going to go to college. I was going to Algonquin College. So I went to the community center to get some assistance to apply for funding. And when I went there, the executive director says, oh, we have some caribou here, some frozen caribou. Would you like some? And it's like, yeah, sure, I'll try it. You know, I don't remember ever having it really since maybe I was seven, six, seven years old. So I ate a piece of frozen raw caribou and I put it in my mouth and immediate, and I still I still remember the way I felt and it was like my god I've been missing this all my life but I didn't know I was missing it like there was always this craving that I had but I didn't know what it was for and it was caribou So now we're just going to leave this to simmer for a little bit it doesn't have to simmer for a long time because caribou doesn't have to be well cooked you want the flavors to go through. If I'm catering events, I'm catering things that it's important to me. People are focused on Inuit culture, promoting Inuit culture and stuff like that. And if I'm catering an event, then I'm going to only cater if it has an Inuit component to it. And if I'm going to be serving country food. It doesn't have to be exclusively country food. Like I'm happy to do other things, but I but there has to be something to do with country food in it. And I'm now, I want to have more of a variety. I'm just like, okay, well, yeah, I can make you a caribou stew or I can roast you an Arctic char. So I'm, I'm starting, I'm, I play more with things. And so, you know, caribou meatballs, muskox with peanut sauce, uh, maple leaves, smoked Arctic char, which is a signature dish, uh, curried caribou, polar bear, seal pate. I did, I made seal pate. Okay, I want to get a nice sear on the peppers. So I'm not moving them too much. And I also, by doing this, I'm just searing them and I'm not turning them to mulch. They're gonna have a bit of a, a crunch when, when we're ready to eat them. But that's, that's all I wanna do, so no more than that. I've, I'm fortunate where I've gone up. I've been up 
I've traveled north several times. I've gone seal hunting. I've gone narwhal hunting. I've gone char fishing. So I, I, I've, I've had that experience. And growing up in Newfoundland, also like just you know, real cleaning rabbits, skinning rabbits. Like I'm not afraid to get in there. Like I butchered my own seal this summer when I was living in Khalavit, and first time ever because it's traditionally it's a man's job. But we were uh, at the Hayutavik Food Center, we were given seal, and it's like, okay, I'm going to learn how to butcher a seal. So, you know, I helped butcher it. I had an elder teach me. It was another man in the in the program. And, you know, he showed me what to do. And it was like, it was just like I was doing this all my life, and I'd never done it before. But for me, it was just a very natural thing, and not being afraid of what I was doing and, and not feeling like, um, not feeling like I shouldn't be here. It's just, it's just it's part of who I am somewhere deep inside. It's, 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 it's really hard to explain, but I think anybody who's really connected to their culture understands. And I had to, rem- I keep needing to remind myself not to lick my fingers when people are watching me. Because- <laughs> oh, I'm laughing because yesterday I was cleaning out some, I was cleaning out a freezer and I was working with caribou and I had, <laughs> I had caribou blood on my hands <laughs> and I licked it off. <laughs> Because we eat our food <laughs> raw, <laughs> so it's nothing to kind of like you know. You're just—it's <laughs> so funny when I think about it. If somebody saw what I was doing, <laughs> it's like so I licked it off before I washed my hands. <laughs> um, so, but you can't do that with cow <laughs> or chicken or anything like that. Oh, all that color in there, all that pan juice, all that pan stuff. I want to deglaze that stuff. <laughs> So I'm going to bring this back to temperature a bit. Food, food is a big part of our culture. It's a big part of any culture, but it's a really big part of the Inuit culture too. Because anytime we have any sort of events and stuff like that, that's a chance for us to share our culture and share our food, especially with community members who might not have access to it. So I'm able to I'm able to call a supplier that I have some and say, "Hey, I'm doing a community event for 500 people. Can you? I need Arctic char. I need caribou." I might be able to call a hunter in a community and say, hey, can you go and catch me a couple of seals because I'm going to be serving, you know, seal uyuk to at, a, at an event. So n- having connections with people, with hunters and fishers in the north, without, without our hunters and fishers, none of this would be possible. So there would be your, your dinner if you were a dinner guest at my house. That was Trudy Metcalf Co. making her renowned curried caribou. If you want to make it for yourself, visit our website at cbc.ca slash unreserved. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169 and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Yeah, so right now I'm just plating up. I'm just going to start my plating soon. So I already mashed up my butternut squash puree, so I put the wild leeks in there that we harvested. I feel it's my job to preserve our heritage through food, and it's our job as chefs and educators. Uh, I got some, some fennel pollen here. I'm wrapping the uh, rainbow trout in just uh, a little bit of wild leeks and some chives, a little bit of paprika, a little bit of fennel pollen, and I want to start plating very, very soon. That was Anishinaabe chef Joseph Shawana cooking from his Toronto kitchen. He was competing in a recent online cook-off with five Indigenous chefs across the country. Viewers gathered around the virtual table and watched as the chef sliced and diced and sautéed. The cook-off was spearheaded by the Indigenous Culinary of Associated Nations, or ICANN for short. Joseph is the acting chair of ICANN. He's also the Indigenous Culinary Advisor at Centennial College and the Executive Chef for Kukum Kitchen. Joseph is from Wikwimikong Unceded Indian Reserve. He joins me from his home in Toronto. Hello, Joseph. Hello, how are you? I'm good, thank you very much. So let's start with the cook-off. Where did the idea for this event come from? We do a lot of event-based functions throughout Canada, 
And once COVID hit, all those events dissolved. So we decided what better way to um, to bring light of what Indigenous food is than to invite any viewer from around the world into our home kitchens. And uh, we cook up a, one item that was forged, that we forged ourselves, and we come up with a dish. And the viewers would actually be able to judge just based on looks. And what was the hope for the event? Our hope was just to give people light of what Indigenous food is. And every region, right? So we had Paul on the trail from Vancouver, Krista from Winnipeg, Jenny from Saskatchewan area, me from Ontario, like Toronto, but I was born and raised on Manitoulin Island. So I have a vast knowledge of Ontario ingredients and uh, says not away from uh, Quebec. So we're almost hitting from coast to coast to coast in Canada. And we're just highlighting the ingredients that are around us, especially during spring when there's a lot of food that's ready to be harvested and foraged stuff that a lot of people don't know about and we are slowly losing so in terms of what i was doing i did a pan seared rainbow trout stuffed with um wild leeks ramps garnished with a little bit of juniper ash so i flamed the juniper got the ash and just garnished it with that so you mentioned you were cooking with wild leeks and they really look so tasty what are wild leeks and where did you get them they mainly grow in um hard wooded maple areas they're one of the first plants, edible plants, that you can harvest during spring. Wild leeks, is it's a cross between a wild onion and a garlic. There's a lot of names for them. There's rams, wild leeks, wild garlic. They're all the same plant, and you can eat the anywhere from the shoot all the way up to the leaves. So me and my wife, we went up to uh, Lion's Head, just north of Wyerton here in Ontario. We took our son, and we harvested a lot of wild leeks. And there's a ways, a sustainable ways to... To harvest them, you don't take out the whole root. You just leave the roots in the ground so they can grow back next year. So right now I have some that are drying in my kitchen windowsill. I've been up there for about two weeks now, about another week to go and they'll be good. And what I usually do with that is I grind it up and I just add a little bit of coarse sea salt to it. I use that just for flavoring any dish that I see fit. So at one point in the cook-off, you had said, it's my job to preserve our heritage through food. What did you mean by that? Anybody who has any knowledge of indigenous culinary stories and recipes and just history, it's it's our job to to preserve those. Um, seeing that residential school like diminished our language and our food was slowly dying with it, so uh, I feel that I have a duty and obligation to preserve as much culinary knowledge in indigenous foods as possible, and it's just something that I that I really enjoy doing. And speaking of the cook-off, how did that go? Was there a winner? So, uh, yeah, Krista from Feast Cafe Bistro in Winnipeg won. We're planning uh, round two in July of this year. Well, that'll be exciting. The Indigenous Culinary of Associated Nations, also known as ICANN, Uh, hosted that competition. What is ICANN? It's a culinary organization that we started to help Indigenous culinary tourism in Canada to share our knowledge of Indigenous ingredients from coast to coast to coast and creating partnerships that way and a way for visiting guests from anywhere from Canada to North America and across the world to come in and experience what our food is and just making sure that... uh, our food history isn't lost. In addition to your role with ICANN, you're you're the Indigenous Culinary Advisor at Centennial College in Toronto, and you're also the Executive Chef of Kukum Kitchen. I've heard something about the full moon dinners that you run at Centennial. What are they? We started a dinner series back in January, a full moon dinner series. So celebrating each full moon, it was just a way for me to highlight what ingredients and stories we can share around these full moon dinners. It's a huge celebration in our heritage. So uh, the last one I did was the broken snowshoe moon. So a lot of maple products, birch syrup, since that day were flowing around the same time. And just the whole story of why did they call it the broken snowshoe moon or the snow crust moon and stuff like that. When our elders and our ancestors were walking out in the land and they would be walking around during maple uh, syrup harvesting time and there still be a lot of snow down on the ground, but yet there still be some soft ground. So the elders would be walking and their snowshoes would break. So that's why they would call it the broken snowshoe moon or the sugar moon because the maple syrup is, 
is uh, running. It depends on which region and what band you're, you're from. And so how have things changed at culinary school since the pandemic? We transitioned everything online. So it was very difficult to move a whole culinary program online. Creating online content is a challenge when you're teaching culinary, since it's a lot of hands-on. But it's been very successful so far. Joseph, your restaurant, Kukum Kitchen, is closed right now. But what are your plans for the future of Kukum? My plans for um, Kukum would be to start it back up in a year's time after the pandemic dies down, but to also create a restaurant that's off of the beaten path. So I think that's where I'm going to take the restaurant next year is allocate some land back up north, back home, back on my reserve, and open up my restaurant back home and serve our traditional foods and our traditional meats that we're not allowed to serve off reserve right so uh, moose deer beaver muskrat we'd be able to serve it to customers back home and that's something that's missing in the restaurant industry outside of reserves is being able to serve our traditional foods 100 percent. you've been working as a chef for many years now so what is your hope then for the future of indigenous cuisines in this country when I first started, even when I first moved to Toronto, nobody knew what indigenous food was. A lot of people still think it's just fry bread and tacos. Nowadays, it's easier for, for me to get knowledge that has been passed down through generations. My hope is that there's at least one indigenous restaurant in every single nook and cranny of Canada. Because every tribe in North America has their own food systems and what sustained them for thousands of years, right? Whether that would be our northern brothers and sisters up in uh, Nunavut or all the way out in, in Yukon to New Brunswick, all the way down to Florida. There's all these old trade routes. It's, it's very interesting once you dig into it. Once you hear one story, you want to hear more. Thank you so much for your time today, Joseph. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. Chef Joseph Shawana is the acting chair of the Indigenous Culinary of Associated Nations. He's the Indigenous Culinary Advisor at Centennial College and the executive chef at Kukum Kitchen. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Our culinary tour on the show today heads to Nain in Nunatsiavut. The research center there takes the samples from ringed seals for scientific study, but it's also used for preparing meat for a community freezer. Carla Pamak is the Inuit research advisor for the Nunatsiavut government. When CBC's John Gowdy visited the center back in November, Carla took samples from two ringed seals with some help from Megan Dicker. Samples are sent off to a laboratory while the rest of the seal is bagged, weighed, and put into the community freezer. John saw how it's all done. 36. 36 inches. 32. 33. So if you need to know which is the maximum and the axle, you just look back here and it tells you um, axle is behind the animal's front flippers. It was 32, and the maximum was 33. I'm thinking it's a female. I think it is, but I'm not 100% sure until I cut it open. I'm getting ready to skin it now. So we got to cut the, cut the flippers and get it ready to be able to peel, not peel back, but take the skin off the seal. Hey, you want them boots or you want a pair of rubbers? Are you talking about twins on there? You are helping out, Megan. Yes, I work upstairs, so they have to help. The community freezer is also the research center, same location, so I'm working with the research center. It's a good workplace because I could get away from my desk and help cut up a seal. <laughs> so what, what went into the bag there, Megan? It's like a flipper. <laughs> yeah. I don't think this guy got a, a manicure lately, that but that's fine. Okay. I'll what? Put the other flipper in with that one. Oh, okay. The kidneys, part of the liver, part of the muscle, the blubber, um, and the lower jaw gets sampled. So th what I just did there, all the pieces I took off and made and put into them bags, that's where we'll be sending that off to the lab in Burlington. It's just a way to 
measure the contaminants, and the rest of the meat goes into the freezer. We look at the length of the seal. We um, measure the, the axle girth and the meridium girth. We measure the blubber thickness as well. What does is, what is it look for in the samples? Oh, so this, this is a program that's done all across Inuit Nunungat, um in different communities. It's looking for mercury um, levels in, in the seal meat, and our levels are below, so we're, we're good. We're, but it's, it's, it's a study that's been happening across Inuit Nunungat, and it's done through the Northern Contaminants Program. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we sample. So when we take a ring seal in, it's done with the ring seals. So the, the rest of the seal that isn't sent off for, for analysis goes into the community freezer? Yeah. 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 Any concerns about contamination of the meat? There's none. We have we yeah. have um, below our 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 seal. The seals that we get here in Nain are are below the averages for mercury. Like yeah, so we're we're doing good. Say ten, fifteen years ago, when they used to do, uh, when they did the started the seal research mm-hmm. uh, for contaminants and stuff like that, the researchers would come in and they would get the seal and then they would take their samples out away from town and then the seal would be gone but since we got the community freezer we take the seal back in here hunters will bring the, se- the whole seal in and we'll we take the samples we don't have any researchers come in to do the sampling anymore we do the samples here at the research center and then we take the rest of the seal meat and put it in the freezer and same with the wings we get we collect wings for the the national wing bee and we do our own uh, Nunatsia wing, wing bee as well. So we take the whole bird into the community freezer, we clip off a wing, and the rest of the bird goes into the freezer. So there's no wastage or whatever. Okay, so what do, you have, what do you have in your hand there? I call it the arm, but I guess it's part of the f- upper flipper. But I usually call it the arm. <laughs> so that, that goes into the freezer? That goes into the freezer. So everything that Megan is, is putting into these, what we call freezer bags, poly bags, We'll go into the freezer, and then the others will, the other in the other bags are going to be sampled. You, we try and get 20 seals to sample each year. Food security is an issue in the north, uh, also here in Nunatsiavut. So it's nice that we get to have wild meat uh, available for community members who maybe cannot access it or do not have the means to go out and harvest it themselves. So it's nice that we have this option. What just went to the bag there? That was a piece of the liver. A piece of the liver? Yeah. I love seal. Liver is my favorite part. Yeah. So prior to this job, I didn't know how to do any of this, as my husband would always do this part, or my son. When we went hunting or whatever for seal, I wouldn't have to worry about it. What is it like to see Carla cutting up the seal here? It's inspiring to see her cut up the meat and show us her skills, and she's also my aunt, so like, there's even that much more pride. <laughs> yeah. Um, Carla was saying that usually it was her husband uh, who would cut up the seal, but she's learned how to do this on the job at the community freezer. It's pretty cool that we have jobs here that offer this type of skill and resource. I encourage anyone who would like to learn more to come and ask her or to ask anyone really if they want to learn how to cut up a seal. It's a skill that will last forever. We all need to eat. This is a really skill, uh, a really important skill for everyone to learn, so it's nice to see that things are becoming more... uh, Fluid and right. Yeah. Where did where did the seal come from? Uh, a harvester got it from just here around Nain. I'm not exactly sure where to. It came in fresh last evening. How much meat do you figure um, as co- will be going into the community freezer from this seal? Do you figure? Um. So all the seal makes has been on the scale. Is that from just this one seal? I'd say about twenty pounds. Yeah. The community freezer is a it's a great place if you need if you need or you would like some wild food in your own home. So we have more than seal. Sometimes we get char, cod, sometimes we get moose sent from Newfoundland. So we have so many different animals that come through. And you and you were saying you work upstairs? Yeah, my office is upstairs, but it's in the same building, so I'm working with uh Ima Pivot. We get to but, but help out when but, Carla and others are cutting up seal. Yes, of course, somebody came up this morning and asked if I'd like to come and help her. So I said, of course, I'll, I'll leave my laptop for a while and come down. It's nearing the end of this nearing seal. Nearing the end. 
The worst is to come. Oh? Getting the jaw off is hard. Seal have really sharp teeth. Wild well, meat. It's the best thing. <laughs> it's healthier than that we can buy in the stores. And it's we know where it comes from, we know the source, we know we know how it's harvested, how it's cut up and how it's uh, shared. So it, that aspect as well it makes it, our meals more more hearty. And there you have it. And there we have it. But we also take the head because people like to eat the head too as well. So the skin I'm gonna put in a bag as well, and it's gonna go in the freezer and someone wants to do crafts or whatever with the skin, then they can come in and pick it up from the freezer. Yeah, so every part that's usable is used. There. That was Carla Pamak, the Inuit Research Advisor for the Nunatsiavut government, and Megan Dicker, who was helping Carla take samples from the seals. They were speaking to the CBC's John Gowdy. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. We'll be back in this radio space next week for more community, culture, and conversation. If you want to learn more or share any of the stories you heard on the show today, you can find them on our website, cbc.ca slash unreserved, or find us on Facebook and Twitter. This episode was produced by Zoe Tennant, Kyle Muzika, Stephanie Cram, and Anna Lazowski. I'm your favorite cousin, Rosanna Deerchild, coming at you from Winnipeg in Treaty 1 territory. Thank you for listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. Ego say. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.